Welcome, everyone. Thank you for turning out tonight. Um, I believe some of you must have seen the email that I sent that said, if you're going to attend one Urban Democracy Lab event this semester, uh, this should be it. So we're super, super excited to have a conversation between uh, a couple of friends, Seren Pillay, who is associate professor at, Uni at the University of Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa, where he leads the research platform of the flagship on critical thought in the African humanities. Uh, Seren is a very well-regarded anthropologist, um, but he's also a public intellectual, and his public writings appear in a number of places, including uh, a monthly column for EPW, which is a Indian uh, news weekly. Um, and we were very lucky when we heard that Seren was going to uh, be here in New York this semester. Uh, and we thought, what a, what a terrific opportunity to have someone make some incendiary remarks about uh, the state of higher education uh, in many countries, including this one. Uh, so, Seren, that's your task. <laughs> uh, those of you not an employee of NYU can say things that those of us who are cannot. And uh, we were extremely fortunate and honored to have uh, someone I, I, I didn't personally know, but I've admired for a long time, uh, Juan Gonzalez, who is visiting as a visiting faculty uh, this semester at NYU. Juan has been a staff columnist with New York Daily News since 1987. And once he starts speaking, you'll recognize his voice as one of the co-hosts of Democracy Now. Uh, he is uh, a very prominent public intellectual in this country. He has been recognized a number of times with many awards, including two Gerald Polk Awards for uh, Commentary and Lifetime Achievement, uh, awards from the National Hispanic Heritage Foundation and from the National Council of La Raza. He's author of several books, and I'll just mention one because it's one of my favorite books. It's The Harvest of Empire, A History of Latinos in America. So um, I'm not sure what the format will be. I think Seren will go first and Juan will offer commentary. And in the spirit of all things UDL, then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Let me mention two things in terms of public service announcement very quickly. We have two very nice events coming up uh, next Monday and the Monday after. Uh, on the 16th, uh, Cynthia Hooper, uh, Infrastructure Aesthetics, uh, it's at the MCC department. Uh, it's an event we're co-sponsoring with them. And then on Monday, the 23rd, Thomas Bouget uh, is going to be talking about participation in, uh, in the European context at, in this very room at 6.30. Okay, so Seren. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jean Paul, uh, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to to share a few thoughts with you and to be in in conversation with with Juan. Um, I have to say, I, I suspect I'm going to uh, disappoint you about in regards to the incendiary remarks because it feels to me like uh, in the last uh, three weeks or so, and I see my colleague from South Africa, Salim, but that's the thing that some of us have been glued to our sources of information, social media, uh, the, the net and WhatsApp, following the uh, events that have been going on in the universities, which have been incredibly uh, incendiary in many ways, uh, and that have taken all uh, shapes and forms and, uh, uh, you know, beyond, as, as beyond the grasp of some of our understanding. So I wanted to, to take this opportunity to um, to talk a bit about some of the animating, I think, uh, issues in the earlier phases of uh, the recent student movement uprisings in South Africa. Um, and that culminated, as many of you uh, might know, in a very public, uh, symbolic uh, um, moment of the toppling, if you like, of the uh, statue of Cecil John Rhodes at the University of Cape Town. Um, when Rhodes' uh, statue was lifted up onto a crane, put onto a truck and driven off into the uh, imperial sunset, if you like. At least that's what some people thought or had hoped. Of course, it is a question of, uh, of you know, unpacking that symbolism, unpacking the moment that led to that, um, that campaign, uh, which has involved uh, mostly uh, students who have driven that and some faculty, I think, who are part of the conversations, but they're very distinct, I think, sets of conversations that are happening. Now, um, 
I, I come here then, I think, with with questions, really, and or what I've called predicaments, to talk about predicaments that we face um, or the big, and that we are beginning to face more squarely. So these are really the kind of conversations that I think uh, we value to be able to talk to people who share, in many respects, our predicaments. And it makes more sense to me to talk through these w with folks who I think um, have something of a shared history, a shared experience. Uh, sometimes that can be, I think, uh, a shared experience of resources. You're talking next week about can you have a free higher education? This is currently the major issue that's under debate in the South African student uh, movement. Um, you know, how to, com to compare how to work with limited resources, particularly with their state systems. Uh, but sometimes it is also uh, an experience that is historical that is shared, uh, historical, political, or existential. So I value the conversation, this particular one, in, for two reasons. I think there's a shared colonial experience among many uh, of us who are here. Um, but I also think in a more precise and important way, there's a shared settler colonial experience. As much as many people in South Africa do not perhaps draw attention to that country as a settler colony, I would venture to say that North America, of course, is sometimes also thought of as an empty land, a terra nullis upon which all could imagine their great futures and celebrate their civilizational achievements. Erased, of course, as you know, is the unpleasant history of the genocide of Native Americans that attends this territorial space as well. In our case, the predicament of settler colonialism, colonialism is that it could not erase the native population. It needed that population. So today we have to live together with each other. Where settlers uh, became a majority uh, and minority assertions uh, play a subversive role as in North America, uh, I'm reminded, of, of course, of the when I was uh, looking into uh, Juan's background, uh, his history in 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 the Lords, uh, in the Young Lords, but also, of course, of uh, a, a longer history in the U.S. of the East LA walkouts of 1968, of figures like Cesar Chavez and Sal Castro. Ours is a similar, but also a different predicament, where a majority that is treated as a minority uh, in its cultural, economic, and social life, and that. And it's that predicament that I want to talk about now by thinking out aloud about the place of Africa in the South African curriculum. And this is one of the, I think, animating uh, questions around which the Roads Must Fall movement evolved initially and around which students and some of the faculty found common cause. Now, the question that I would start with is, of course, why are we, uh, some South Africans and students, posing, posing this question in, in such a way at this point in this at this time? What is this Africa that we are referencing and this Africa whose very presence, we might say, is being marked by its absence uh, when we ask that question? If we are asking about the place of Africa in the curriculum today, it is worth asking about the meaning of Africa and the vantage point that we are thinking that question from. There is a way in when, that when we ask uh, that question, we are immediately establishing a distinction of some order between an Africa and South Africa. And I was talking to colleagues uh, at a meeting in Ethiopia a few months ago, and I was struck by the fact that they too have a debate there um, about the place of Ethiopia in Africa. Are Ethiopians African? And in uh, Cairo and in Tunis and in Algiers, people are asking about place of Africa, their, their Africa, uh, and where they are located. So being geographically African and being culturally African are not always the same thing. From within South Africa, there is a way in which Africa is an object of threat that we know all too well, not just in the present. It was the Africa of the Cold War, the Africa of buffer states, the Africa of the Red Peril, Mozambique, Angola, and so on, and, the, and Cuba's role in that, in that conflict. And I was struck by that fact when I was doing some research on, pedagogy, on the pedagogy of counterinsurgency in, in the South African military and policing schools. The Defense Force had encouraged knowledge on and about Africa, that place out there, for strategic reasons. They had analysts, the, like intelligence agencies everywhere, social science and humanities scholars who did country studies, who did threat assessments, a version, of course, of what the US Army today calls uh, human terrain studies, where they uh, gainfully employ one or two anthropologists, I believe, who are looking for jobs. The military rationale, of course, of that study was reinvented as a civilian one in the post-apartheid period. But the Africa of a threat out there remains in some ways embedded in the ways in which security studies in universities frame its approach to understanding Africa. 
Security studies is after all premised on insecurity and something becoming a threat. There's another predecessor to the conversation on Africa in South Africa, as it figures in the institutional domains of knowledge production and more squarely brings to, uh, the question of the curriculum to the fore. And that was a debate at the University of Cape Town in the mid 1990s, sparked by the design of a course by what was then the AC Jordan professor at African studies, a newly hired Ugandan scholar by the name of Mahmoud Mamdani, who some of you might have heard of, who was recruited to head the Center for African Studies at UCT. Now that debate, which had become, has become known today again by these students, and to some extent in the most current renditions of it, it's a debate that, has seen, that was seen to have pitted white scholars against black scholars at UCT. But I think this would be to miss a fundamental aspect about the kind of reproach that we as South Africans were being, were being given in, uh, in Mamdani's criticism uh, at the time. As he was to put it when reflecting on the trouble he got himself into when redesigning the first year core course of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at UCT, quote, to create a truly African studies, one would, have to, one would first have to take on the notion of South African exceptionalism and the widely shared prejudice that while South Africa is a part of Africa geographically, it is not quite culturally and politically, and certainly not economically. It is a point of view, he lamented, that I have found to be the hallmark of much of the South African intelligentsia shared across the divides, white or black, left or right, male or female, close quote. There was something quite stinging in that last sentence, white or black, left or right, male or female. Because for those of us who were shaped by the South African Academy, who had come through it politically conscious, there was, a, there was a set of fundamental divides that we had inherited, particularly in the English-speaking universities. The divides in progressive scholarship and political life and activist life was whether you were a liberal or a Marxist. And for others, it was still a question of whether you were a Marxist or a nationalist. And for others still, it was whether you were a white Marxist or a black nationalist. Almost inevitably, to be a nationalist tended to coincide with being black. And then for some, it was, of course, a question of whether you were a feminist or an unreconstructed patriarch and traditionalist. These, of course, there's that old joke about the left and the Trotskyites, and, you know, put three Trotskyites in a room and you have four splits. Well, you know, it's just something along those lines. The most prominent of what was the, these debates, the race class debate, was a debate that, seemed to, that, seemed, that still seems to uh, animate many today and seems to be the only one that some people are, think are, is worth having. It's the difference, you might say, between the impulses that drove the roads must fall movement and what today is being called the, the fees must fall movement, the one emphasizing the identitarian questions of what is in the South African curriculum, what is our colonial heritage, and the other emphasizing the question of our, the economic situation that most of our students face, in other words, the class question. Well, in Mamdani's critique of South African exceptionalism, these divisions were being momentarily collapsed. In, not into opposing sides, but into a common identity, a shared set of assumptions and presumptions. South African exceptionalism named something that we all shared as partisans despite our protestations. For many of us, the Africa of counterinsurgency military thinking that was in vogue in some white universities on the one hand, and the Africa of the radical and liberal scholarship in South Africa appeared on opposing sides. But in many ways, they were opposing sides of a shared coin. For both of us, Africa was out there. Africa inside the university was something that we studied as a separate experience. The African experience, you might say, in the South African university has been institutionalized in the domain of area studies, a bit like ethnic studies here. It was apart from the mainstream disciplines. It was particular, but it was not universal. So that even when it was inside, one might say it was out there. It was a particular experience, while the universal experience, the experience of what we might call the West or the rest, was an experience that existed in the mainstream disciplines that we were taught. The South African university system had reproduced, in that sense, a Euro-American model which had, which had the familiar distinctions that we would describe uh, for many of these situations. The politics of the native subject was not political science, but anthropology. The music of the native was not music, but ethnomusicology, and so on and so forth. The South African Academy was therefore historically premised on the assumption that the native experience was not a universalizable experience. And to that extent, the liberal and the radical shared some assumptions that the particularity of the native subject could be, would be, and should be displaced by the forces of the market. 
that a market-based identity, such as that of being a revolutionary worker, would be the turnkey identity that would shape our consciousness at the end of the day, our historical consciousness, if you like. That, you, that, that is to say, it would make consciousness, uh, that it would unite us across the divides that we inherited. Now, the, this assumption, which we of course call a teleological assumption of colonial modernity, was that our freedom, our equality, um, would, would, would be achieved by dissolving all of these particular attachments that we might have inherited, whether these be religious, ethnic, or racial uh, attachments. Well, freedom, so freedom therefore was conceived in these universal terms, and all of the aspects of culture and identity was individualized as part of our private life. If the one was a sign of our progressiveness, the other would be a marker of our backwardness, our traditionality, and so on. What I'm talking about here, of course, is, is not just the Africa of Africa out there, but the Africa of the native subject. The black South African subject was then an object of knowledge. The pe peculiar thing, as I recall it, and one is, of course, taking a liberty of vast generalizations. I mean, you know, Foucault can get away with vast generalizations of an epoch. I think we can take some liberties is that the South African native experience in South Africa, within the academy, within African studies, uh, institutes in the military academy and so on, arrived via the knowledge of African studies produced in the Euro-American world. Africa in the South African curriculum, as I recall it, as a student, arrived via those who write on Africa, but are not, as we might say, of Africa. Something like 80% of the writing on Africa today comes from those outside Africa. Now, there's a slippery slide here to being heard to say that only those from Africa should write about Africa. And that's, of course, not anywhere near what I'm saying. I am, however, wanting us to pause on this point before we frown, out, frown on it as a kind of nativism in order to ask what this critique is naming. It is naming an inequity in power relations about who writes about who and who can be in the global relation of things to write about them. It was to ask the question, as one scholar put it, of whether you could have an anthropology of the West. The point is not that you couldn't as such, but whether the status of the knowledge produced would be authorized and legitimated in the same way. And in that sense, you couldn't have an anthropology, African anthropology of the West. So by saying that most of the knowledge on Africa that we are taught in the South African Academy was written by those who write about Africa but were not from Africa, it is to register an inequality in knowledge production. It is to name a problem, but it is not to offer an easy solution. That's where we are, I think, uh, avoiding a certain kind of cheap politics of representation that calls into question essentializing this or that, or that can point out the critique of native subjects who, uh, that, who speaks on our behalf and so on is the only uh, game in town. Although it is an important question, I'm saying, to raise. So if the observation that the South, Af South African exceptionalism was to be one with more than a grain of truth to it, then the structure of that exceptionalism would require that we would be in South Africa self-reflexive about it. It would raise the rather difficult question of how a mode of rule that connects the Africanists who write about Africa and the South African scholar who writes from inside South Africa are connected. This does set the South African experience apart from most of the other, Africas on, other countries on our continent. It's settler colonial dimension. It is most evident in the equalization of political citizenship, where in other places there was no settler minority to contend with, or that minority left at independence, who was so small as to not constitute an ongoing battle in the cultural, social, and economic sphere of life. Ours is that a continuous battle that wages itself in newspaper columns, in private spaces, on the internet, uh, uh, in private chat rooms, constant battle over the, uh, over the legitimacy of certain people's claims and the defensiveness of others. The constant contending with the sensibility that thinks that nothing can be gained, learned from this place, Africa out there. So why should we universalize it as part of the mainstream curriculum? How does Africa out there then become Africa in year? In other words, how does Africa out there become us? I don't just mean in the sense of no borders or passports or trade tariffs being done away with, but ontologically indistinguishable. If Pan-Africanism, in whatever trace is left of it from its initial impulse, is the name of something, then it would have to, re then it would have to replace the Africa out there with the Africa is us. This is more than a simple platitude and more complicated than a slogan to put on a banner. 
It is more complicated than putting African scholars who write about Africa into the curriculum. It is more complicated than creating new institutes of African studies or defending old institutes of African studies. If Africa are there as a mediated object, something we come to know through what we read, as something that exists in discourses and in imperial and colonial languages with modernist and teleological assumptions, then in some ways to ask the question of the place of Africa in the South African curriculum today, as these movements are, are asking, is already to say that we are faltering into an identity politics, but one with good intentions. If Africa is not to be an area studies object for us, and if we tend or wish to not reproduce it as the referent of area studies, then the question might not be posed as about what is the place of Africa in the South African curriculum. The South African curriculum will have to be, by its very geospatial setting, be African. But, but this brings us back to the question, why are we asking it now? Why is it animating so much energy now? And by now, I don't necessarily just mean today, but as a post-apartheid question, posed at least since 96, when the question was asked uh, by Mahmoud Mamdani, and many of us were not entirely ready to receive the, the gift of that question. The question being, should an African university, for example, have a center for African studies? Residing in that question was our partners, Africa out there, and the predicament of how we would internalize Africa. These past few months, the students at some campuses have put it on the agenda more explicitly and asked the question that the 96 debate at UCT raised and that some of us have raised in different ways about the decolonization of the university. In the post-independence period, to decolonize knowledge produ production, to undo the epistemic violence of colonial education in some parts of the continent, was synonymous with a nationalist-led state project to Africanize. Africanization was the form that decolonization took. Africanization put the question of indigeneity on the table, who was an African, and its watchword to the universities was relevance. What are you teaching that is relevant to Africans? There were different forms of nationalist Africanization projects, ranging from Mobutu's project of Africanization to the debates at Dar es Salaam about what curriculum transformation would look like and those that were cultivated in particular under Nerere's rule. Rather than talk then about Africa in the South African curriculum, I would want to suggest that when we contend with the question of what it would mean to make the South African curriculum an African curriculum, what would it mean to Africanize the curriculum? I'm of course speaking from my limited vantage point in the humanities and social sciences. Here I think I would want to make a distinction between being an Afrocentric curriculum and an Africanized curriculum. To make the curriculum an African curriculum is for me a disposition. It is less about what Nietzsche called monumental history and more about what he called critical history. It is about marking the location from which we think outwards rather than a call to think inwards. It is to privilege our location as an, as an inheritance of, of predicaments that is aware of all of its affiliations that come with it. Inheritance, as, as you know, are not things we choose. Like the saying goes, you do not choose your family uh, but you choose your friends. Wittgenstein might have said, we don't choose the language that we are born into. Well, just like family or mother tongue, we don't choose our inheritances. Our inheritances give us predicaments. One of these predicaments being that we have inherited in the apartheid university across the racial div divides and the divides of advantage and disadvantage. We all inhabit, albeit differently, the universities of apartheid settler colonialism. I say that less as an accusation, not an indictment, more as an inheritance, the acknowledgement of an inheritance from which we have to think, which we have to teach, which we have to write. I think that because we have not adequately acknowledged this predicament and not really accepted that we have to Africanize our universities, it is, e it is in perhaps, to, to, uh, perhaps too Freudian a way of thinking, taking some of our children to slay the father to remind us that we have to deal with this predicament. I mean, after all, Cecil John Rhodes was the ultimate father figure who had to be slayed. When we ask, what does it mean to think the world from where we are at then, from a location, and ask what it means for how we organize knowledge, how we teach, who we teach, or who we compare ourselves to, who we learn from, we are calling into question then a colonial sensibility that lives on in the present the one that goes all the way back to Thomas Macaulay's famously dismissive remark about who produces any worthy, anything worthy of being called civilization. The question then might be asked, do we, want, do we want to return ourselves to the particular against the universal? Do we want to step out of the global and the cosmopolitan only to think about the local? 
is relevant as some previous generations of nationalists argued the criteria for knowledge or is it not the straitjacket of parochialism and narrow thinking? And isn't it above all the worst charge of all, a kind of nationalism that we are advocating? Some of the scholars who have advocated these views have been called applied nationalists because they have argued that location and history matters. This is not to make light of the very skeptical voices and the questions that they pose. But what these skeptics seem to miss is that there is an authorizing structure of nationalism that animated the project of uh, imperial and colonial rule, as well as the revolts against it. As the Indian scholar Partha Chatterjee so eloquently reminded us, nationalism was not simply a derivative discourse. Here I found the, the work of the Palestinian intellectual Edward Said incredibly helpful. Said was well aware of the ambiguity of nationalism in the anti-colonial revolt and worked within it while being critical of it. For him, it was an indispensable phase towards a certain kind of future, defined not, not by more identity politics, but in a certain way toward a future less defined by identity politics. For Said, it was not about giving up identity, but about dealing with the destructiveness that follows the investment of identity with a political stake. For him, sensitive to the colonial predicament of our modernity and the question of Palestine in his own biography, one had to first have the right to the identity in order to exercise the right to choose to give it up. It was a question of how and in which way to do that without the, the distinctiveness of histories of affiliation. Colonial occupation precisely withholds sovereignty and by extension invalidates your right to choose your identity. Recall his poignant discussion on the figure of the exile through the writings of those he admired, Nietzsche, Lukács, Auerbach, and Adorno. Said paused on a remarkable story by Victor St. Hugo, cited by the e exiled Erich Auerbach. The tender soul, said St. Hugo, has fixed his love on one spot in the world. The strong man has extended his love to all places. The perfect man has extinguished his. But as Said went on to emphasize, lest we see in that a rejection of an attachment to place that a colonized or an exiled subject would hold on to. For Saint Hugo, the strong or perfect man, ex achieves independence and detachment by working through his attachments, not by rejecting them. Attachments to histories and what he calls experiences were central to Said's formulation of a critical consciousness. The talk about decolonizing the curriculum then stems from a critical consciousness that opens the possibility to recognize that in the injustice that cultivates what I have called the arrogance of ignorance. The view that outside of Euro-America there's not much worth knowing or that we need to know about. And it allows us to appreciate and come to terms with the importance of attachment, the political necessity of naming ours as an African curriculum. To say that we need to Africanize our universities is to say we need to work in order to, to define a new, what it might mean to work towards shaping that. We do not drift without form or shape in an ocean from nowhere that is everywhere, and that knows only the eight temporality of cosmopolitanism. Ours is a different story where iron shackles mark place, where slave clocks mark time, where textbooks encourage ignorance, where trespass was the name for walking between the town and the countryside. This is what is particular about our universality. Finally, let me conclude by saying that the binary as it comes up in debates on transforming or decolonizing the curriculum, which pits the local against the global, the universal against the particular, rights against justice, freedom against nationalism, as const are constraining and obfuscating rather than useful to think our way out of our inheritance or our predicaments. The Senegalese philosopher Suleiman Bashir Jan, who is now at Columbia University, has suggested that the way to think about decolonization and the universal uh, is not to concede the universal to an imperial imagination, but to work towards a truly universal universalism. We need not give up on the uni in the university, but we can try to redefine the very idea of the university itself. And in that re redefinition, redefinition, enact the sovereign choice to decide through debate and deliberation how we can teach a new generation of our students to think the world from Africa, so that we might one day talk not about Africa, in the South African curriculum, but we might rather talk about the South African curriculum as an African curriculum. Thank you. I know that was not incendiary, I hope. But, uh,
Should we sit here? Huh? No, it's okay. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's almost ironic that um, we're having this, this discussion this evening because for those of you who pay attention to the news, you've probably heard about what's been going on at the University of Missouri, <laughs> uh, where a university president resigned today uh, only less than 24 hours after the African-American students on the football team uh, threatened that they would not play <laughs> uh, football. Uh, because of the continuing uh, racism and the failure of the university to address uh, racism on campus. So we've come, and I've never seen action so quickly <laughs> by a university to the demands of its students uh, as we saw uh, this week, uh, which shows you uh, the enormous importance the university places to the revenue that it gets uh, from its uh, football team. Uh, and. Um, but I, I guess we would take uh, all attempts to uh, reform uh, the universities uh, uh, in modern society. Uh, we'll, we'll accept them from wherever they come. Uh, and uh, who knows that this may not spread now across all of the universities, especially the state universities of America, who so much depend on the, the revenue of their football teams and thus of the African-American uh, uh, players uh, that they all uh, spend so much time recruiting. Uh, I think the the key thing that I, comes to mind as I'm, I'm listening to Sarin's uh, uh, presentation is how the anti-colonial struggle in the universities in the United States developed. And he alluded to the period of 60, 1968, 69, which I think was really the, uh, if you want to go back and see the seminal moments, that was the time with uh, uh, first um, uh, with uh, high school students that had already been student involvement in the social movements through SNCC and uh, and uh, uh, and SDS and other organizations, uh, but really the 68-69 period. When you think about it, it not only uh, you had the the longest strike in the history of American universities, which was the San Francisco State strike uh, of 1968. Uh, uh, led by a third world students group. Among the leaders of that movement was uh, a young uh, leader of the, of the students of San Francisco State named Danny Glover, who went on to much greater fame later on. Uh, and, um, uh, and there were the students at Cornell University uh, who seized uh, their campus with weapons. <laughs> uh, there were uh, outbreaks throughout all of the universities, really in the United States, uh, and, and it was the first generation of African-American and Latino and Asian-American students that had any significant numbers uh, uh, in those campuses. Uh, for the most part, they were inspired by the anti-colonial movements around the world. And I think the key thing to understand as we're talking about whether it's a, a minority confronting a settler majority or a, or a majority confronting a settler minority uh, is that... Um, there's enormous inspiration across national boundaries uh, so that the African-American and Latino and uh, Asian-American students and Native, uh, and Native American students really see themselves, I think, and have seen themselves as extensions of uh, their homelands within the United States. Uh, and you know, I, as, as I've often said, I think the big, the big uh, change in the world of the last um, uh, half century or more is that the third world has come to the West. <laughs> uh, that uh, that uh, after World War II, uh, the peoples of the colonial nations started coming to the West. And they came in such numbers that they have actually helped begun to transform uh, these countries. And, uh, so in France, they don't know what to do about all the Algerians and the Tunisians and the Moroccans. And, and in England, they don't know what to do about all the Pakistanis and the Indians and the Jamaicans. In the United States, they don't know what to do about all the, the Latin Americans and Caribbeans. In Germany, they don't know what to do about all the Turks. And the people came largely from the former co colonies of those European powers. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that most resistant, I think, to change has been uh, uh, the university. Uh, where clearly there was progress made uh, in the establishment of these area studies, uh, these ethnic studies that developed as a result of these 
uh, of these conflicts in, this, in the late 60s and early 70s, and a whole group of, of uh, those students then went on to become professors and to develop curriculums and to challenge the, the teaching at the universities, but there was enormous fight back. And I think the only thing that prevented the fight back from crushing this movement was the continued growth of the populations of African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans and Asian Americans in the universities. So every year, a whole new group of students started coming in sort of still not clear of their own identity or relationship to American life. And so they kept asking and seeking more answers. So we've had an ongoing battle, I think, in this country. Uh, uh, and uh, in, if, in, if, if in South Africa they talk about South African exceptionalism, well, the United States has made ex exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, uh, practically uh, part of the Bible of, un of uh, understanding uh, our, our historical development. So I think that um, uh, that the, 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 the key issue then becomes, as the population grows and changes, what is the nature of the overall curriculum or, or uh, knowledge production that all of the students at, at a university get, as well as the kind of research that the professors do. And I'm, um, I don't know how many of you have seen um, Hamilton, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's new play. And I think that if you follow Lin-Manuel's trajectory, and by the way, I'm going to be doing a conversation with him here at, uh, next Monday night with him and, uh, and, uh, and Sonia Massano so I, at Skirball, so I invite you all, if you can, to come. But um, what Lin-Manuel has done, if you follow his, he's only done two musicals. His first musical would be what you would call area studies. <laughs> uh, it was in the Heights. It was about... Um, it was about um, young people in Washington Heights, his own community. Uh, and I'm sure that when Broadway saw it, they said, oh, this is a, a, a brand new talent uh, who is now trying to bring the Latino experience uh, to our theater. But then he did something revolutionary, which is he tackled the creation myth of the United States, uh, the the development of the founding fathers and their role in the creation of the country, uh, and he did it with uh, African American and Latino actors playing all playing George Washington and uh, and Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, and Aaron Burr and all of the the key figures of American of, of American history, and he did it in rap, and he has totally revolutionized the creation myth. He's, he's uh, put um, blackface minstrelsy on, on, its, uh, on its head, uh, and he is now defining for all Americans, uh, not just for African Americans and Latinos, how we understand the history of the country. Uh, and so it really is a revolutionary act in the theater, uh, but I think it points to here's a kid uh, from uh, Washington Heights, who went to Western University, who has now become the the biggest star, performing star in the country, uh, and uh, and I think that that is a reflection of where we're going. Uh, that yes, there have been setbacks, uh, this, uh, and yes, there's a continuing debate uh, in the country as to the relative importance, uh, the centrality, the uh, the uh, of these ethnic studies and African-American and Latino studies uh, uh, and the debate in academia. But the problem is the demographics of the world <laughs> are determining what's going to happen. Uh, the reality is that globalization uh, is not just an issue of money and capital. It's also a question of labor and people. Uh, and the more you globalize the world economy, the more you force people to move from one nation to another, the more the debate will arise over what is the cultural tradition, the intellectual history, the, the, the roots of any particular country. So all of the countries are becoming globalized. Uh, they're all uh, having their populations changed. They're all having their creation myths challenged and their historical roots reexamined. Uh, and I 
think that it's just a question of being able to have a more equitable system of determining who gets the research grants and who gets the, uh, the chance to write the textbooks and who gets to uh, help shape the narrative, uh, but that there will be a continual contesting of the narrative. Uh, um, so I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I've learned a lot just by listening about the particular battles going on in South Africa right now. Uh, but I think that uh, it's something that we all have a, uh, a, play, a role to play in. Because as I look around this room, I know that this room is nothing like what this room would have been 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, NYU or any of these schools are nothing like in the composition of their students. They still got a long way to go with their faculty, but at least in the composition of the student body, uh, it's, they're nothing like what they used to be. And so I think that we've got to continue to understand that this is the future. This is what is coming into being. Uh, and uh, all of, all of uh, us who stay in one relationship or another to uh, the universities and the, ac and the academic world will have to contend with the change which is beyond the control of anyone uh, because uh, it is a, uh, uh, the market has an amazing ability to force changes. Uh, you know, we used to say as a debate between the liberals and the Marxists, does, does uh, being determine consciousness or does consciousness determine being? Uh, and I think that uh, our consciousness is being determined by our being. Hi, Siren. Um, thank you for that talk. I thought it was really interesting and uh, coming from South Africa myself. Um, I just wanted to introduce really two topics for the discussion. I think in terms of moving the discussion slightly forward from the sort of roads must fall to the fees must fall thing, one of the one of the things which I've been thinking of, I've been sitting here much like yourself and been trying to keep in track what's happening at home, but um, what's happened in my mind to an extent with fees must fall is that protests about fees and financial exclusion have become a regular feature of, I mean, we can call them historically black campuses or more working class student bodies for years now in South Africa. I mean, they've been a defining feature of many of these campuses like uh, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology or the University of KwaZulu-Natal or the University of Fort Hare for many years now. But what I think fees must fall has seen the first time these various sort of localized struggles coalesce into the sort of elite institutions of South Africa, the, I mean, South African elite universities, such as the University of Cape Town, Rhodes University, and particularly the University of the Witwatersrand. And to an extent, the fact that these struggles have extended there means two things. I think one is uh, we have to discuss what the role, I mean, it sort of goes without saying, is in terms of has something changed in terms of higher education funding in one, and two, among students who are trying to uh, negotiate these struggles, there's a formula, form, uh, and I think it's a tenuous and fragmented solidarity between students at these elite institutions and students at working class institutions. At these more working class institutions, if you like, students often face more repression and have less media attention. I mean, there have been students killed in certain campuses before, if I remember correctly, in South Africa since 1994. I can think of one in UKZN, for instance, and how students relate to it. And there was an incident um, at this big national protest in which students from uh, the Transvaal, I mean, the Shwana University of Technology uh, confronted WIT students, and there was a feeling that WIT students had sort of betrayed their working class comrades there. And maybe discuss it. The second thing is, um, I think part of the struggle, at least, and this is partially uh, what I've been thinking of a lot recently, of decolonizing uh, the South African education system is also is not just simply a challenge of locating South Africa with it as not exceptional to Africa, but I also think it's part of our, our struggle is to negotiate forms of thinking about, uh, I don't like to use the term, but I can't think of a better one, that the global south and countries in Latin America, India, the Middle East, as a way of thinking directly and engaging with scholars there and students there without being mediated through the lens of uh, thinking about South Africa in relation to through the United States or the United Kingdom, which have been historically been the ways. And I think part of that has to do with thinking about how do we introduce concepts of thinking about South African uh, comparative experiences, not only in Africa, but in terms of countries which have had similar historical experiences and debates right now. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that as well. Uh, 
right. Thank you. Thanks. So there was a, a number of really important points you've made, uh, and I and I just want to underscore them and say that you know it is interesting that the uh, of course this movement um, does speak to the kinds of divisions between South African universities. And for those of you that don't know, we more or less have uh, a state system of university. All our universities uh, are, st are state universities, but but vastly unequal in their resources and identities based on the imparted, apartheid inheritance. So formerly predominantly white English-speaking universities, former predominantly white Afrikaans-speaking universities, uh, black African universities, and so on and so forth. And the resources, of course, go down a, a sliding scale. So there is that division across the system. Uh, and as you rightly point out, there have been protests around fees uh, in the last decade, I would say, uh, at other universities that have not uh, got the same kind of uh, perhaps attention. And this is an issue in, this, in both the staff and student uh, debates at the moment. But what I think is interesting, and this is to 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 uh, acknowledge the point that I think one made, is that the demographic at our, at South African universities across the board has changed, and so the historically white elite universities themselves have now taken in. If we think that uh, student enrollment at universities have more or less doubled uh, since '94 in South African universities, that the that the racial composition of elite universities like WITS. Uh, or uh, UCT and so on are now almost half the student uh, body uh, black South African students. Um, that brings new demands into those universities. M many people say, well, these students come from uh, middle class and upper class backgrounds. But of course, what, what, these, what these students are raising in these movements is that the black middle class in South Africa itself is a very tenuous uh, category. This is very much first generation black South Africans these are South Africans who are heavily, um, in many uh, instances, indebted uh, that the university education has uh, indebted many families so that their kids are there who are in debt. So I think when the fees issue emerged this time around at, at what we would say has a, a, a black South African universities with more working class students, um, those issues do resonate uh, with the students at UCT, at BITS, at Rhodes, in ways that we're beginning to see now as the numbers at those universities change. But I think there's an, also an interesting way in which the connection between the sort of what I'm just naming as Rhodes must fall, although these sentiments exist at other universities, helps to mediate this connection around class issues between sort of elite or middle class students and working class students. And it's the idea of what they would describe as drawing on some of the American discourses of symbolic pain and suffering, that uh, that as students in a predominantly white university like UCT, black students can say that we come from relatively okay families, but we can identify very quickly with the pain and suffering of, of working class students and their families. We come from many of those communities, we have those connections, but that we can also say that our class uh, identities do not do not uh, save us from the experiences of racial minoritization or the experiences of racial discrimination or the ways in which an institution uh, can alienate us. Um, that uh, that class has not bought us an entry point to a painless or, or, or an easy ride into an elite institution. So as these numbers uh, and the demographics are shifting both at elite and uh, uh, more working class universities, we are seeing uh, these kinds of connections, I think, being made across universities. The, the other question that you raise is very important, and that is, of course, that the, the question of location and thinking of ourselves as an African university is very much part of, part, very much in my conception of the, that uh, project, is the idea of thinking from our location, but thinking the world from our location, and is, is, is premised on the idea that part of that is incorporating knowledge from other parts of the world, including Latin America, South Asia, and so on. And they're beginning to, you know, the South African university system is slowly coming out of its work. We're beginning to hire people now from, uh, we have a Center for Indian Studies at Wits University. We're beginning to hire more scholars from the African continent in our universities. We're beginning to draw in scholars from Latin America. But again, 
it's the question of a uh, kind of slow progression towards that because if you want somebody to teach that you have to be researching those questions you need scholars who are going to be we need to be training a generation of phd students who are not only going to work on uh, south africa for example or cape history you know I, my, I have a general sort of rule with students i'm working on now is you can't work on cape history or south african stuff you know work on the continent or work on some other part of the world and so on uh, because with the idea that these are going to be the, the students who are going to enter into our university system to teach. And if we, if my generation, was not trained to be able to teach uh, material from other parts of the world and we are teaching ourselves, our students are teaching themselves now. They're organizing their own reading groups, these, their own teachings. They, you know, reading Fanon because they're not getting it in the curriculum. They're reading, they're, they're talking around questions of gender and intersectionality, uh, you know, all these debates that the feminist debates that around knowledge and so on that they're not finding in the reflected in the curriculum, they're doing it themselves. It's so they're in a sense pushing us and we have to in these moments catch up. We don't know where it's going. It has all kinds of pitfalls, of course, and that's why we know we're almost the sort of last to come on the, you know, on the, on the independence uh, train in a sense where we we're getting there, so there's a lot to learn from those who've come before, I think. Uh, I have a question while others are thinking. <laughs> uh, uh, is there a problem right now in terms of a brain drain in South Africa, in terms of those who are, as you're saying, doctoral students or who are the, the, uh, the the cream of what the universities are, are producing when they're being lured away? Yeah. Um, in some ways, n n n not. And yes, there, in some areas, uh, uh, training professionals, for example, medical uh, doctors and so on uh, in the health sphere, they, there is um, a worry that people who are graduating from South African universities don't want to go into the public health system and so on and are leaving uh, the country. But in say, in the area of humanities and social sciences, um, we in some ways have, the problem is that uh, not of a brain drain, but we have a, a severe shortage of people in the pipeline. So I know the big crisis here is an overproduction of humanities and social science scholars uh, who can't find jobs because you're producing so many excellent PhDs. Uh, and so our problem is in some ways that we have too few people in the pipeline who can be absorbed into the, uh, into the, into the university job market. It's a very sluggish and 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 and, and slow you know organized in such a way that it's hard to create new positions because it's a state system uh so taking people in keeping people in the university system is a challenge our, our problem in terms of brain drain is that uh, we then want to keep the few students that we graduate in the university system they're not always posts available to them so we have to think creatively about how to keep them in a relationship with the university and find funding for those things through other sources. The friends here from the SSRC who run a, a program that supports that, um, like uh, uh, Salim Badat here plays a very important role in supporting work in South Africa around you know PhD students who can stay in the country, who will be absorbed. So we have to think creatively uh, about that. But the, the big crisis is, is one of, of uh, keeping people in the university system and producing more people, actually recruiting uh, more candidates uh, who will take up positions. Yeah. Thank you uh, both so much for, um, for your comments. Um, I had a question um, in some ways connecting um, your comments with your talk, which is, um, you know, you spoke in the U.S. about the rise of ethnic studies and um, uh, race, um, sort of race at the forefront um, in the academy, resulting out of the student movements of the 60s and 70s. And Seren, you're talking about, um, in some ways, questions raised in post-colonial um, studies, um, which in some ways has been disconnected from political movements, certainly in this country. Um, so there is a disconnect, for example, between the intellectual work of post-colonial scholarship and work in ethnic studies, both 
in the academy and on the streets. And now perhaps there's a moment when those worlds are connecting. But it's interesting that it's in South Africa. Um, you know, I, I, I'm wondering what those connections are transnationally, um, what you think in terms of the relationship between, say, critical race studies and post-colonial studies and the relationship between the university and the street, um, whether in South Africa or in the US, between those two fields. Well, it's not an easy proposition to take up, but I you know, if I'll go, you know, just have a go at it first. I think for us, it's very much, uh, in some ways, um, the benefit you know, of, of where we are at, in a sense, is, as I said, that we can learn from a lot of experiences that have gone before us. And um, we have not, w these are debates that I think are, are incipient. They are, in, they are both within the university, they are without, but they are now also at the point where we are thinking about how do you institutionalize this, for example, right? And I think those are, those are debates that happen here. And so in a, in a way, one thing to say is that we would have to be very cautious in the in the way in which we institutionalize some of these questions, so that we don't further balkanize uh, the kinds of uh, questions that we want to pose. balkanize that distinction between one that that asks questions that post-colonial theory might ask, for example, about nationalist projects, right? Uh, uh, f and, 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 and quarantine it from the questions of representation and so on that come up, the very real questions of demands for space within an institution that, uh, that require uh, uh, one to self-identify in a, in a certain kind of way without dissolving that identity or problematizing it immediately. So we're trying to, in a sense, if we're taking forward these experiences out of critical race studies and post-colonial theory, it is to walk that line in a way and be careful about how how we do it. As I said, being being a situation where interestingly, you know, one of the, the the inspirational discourses that our students are drawing on is very much coming out of uh, out of the US. Uh, uh, that is that is coming out of very out of a very real experience of people being treated, you know, where you're a minority in a certain kind of majority and you and you're fighting to one to get a space to be recognized two to then keep that space three to expand that space so that you're not ghettoized in a corner as as some of the ethnic studies programs have been done uh, and 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 in that way kind of domesticated and kept out of the mainstream uh, and and so we we have those discourses are being drawn on a lot by 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 some of our students who, are, who find inspiration in that but as i said we're we're also in the uh, unstoppable force of, of being, we, we will, our, st our students will be majority black African, uh, whether in 10 years or 50 years down the line, the fact that we have 80% white faculty uh, now is going to change. That's not going to hold, you know, uh, the fact that we're now up to, I think, a 72% average uh, of black students as, as the, the student population. So that will change, but we, we're gonna have to think about a different problem then is, is does a discourse that empowers a minority in a majority situation, how long will that discourse work when we start to see majority assertions emerge? You know, For example, and here we might have the thing to do to learn from India about what's going on there now, right? Is what happens when a majority starts asserting that this is the character of this, of this country and the state uh, against a minority that has, that has held on to uh, its assertions and so on. No, well, I, I think well clearly the 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 whole ethnic studies movement was an anti-colonial movement. It just didn't didn't necessarily uh, develop the theory first. It developed the practice and then built the theory based on that practice. Uh, and and I, I'm struck also by the the changes in the character of that struggle because when I, I was in school. In, in school uh, decades ago, it was uh, largely uh, 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 Puerto Rican and Mexican and uh, African American students. But as the population shifted, and as to some degree those groups got to some degree placated uh, uh, or co-opted, uh, it was it became the new uh, migrant students that became. For instance, in the uh, uh, I remember in the late. 70s, and I was in Philadelphia at the time, there were large groups of 
Filipino students, Eritrean and Ethiopian students in, in, uh, in, in Philadelphia uh, at the universities because the movements in their countries where there's the, the anti-Marcos, uh, ins the insurgency of the Philippine Communist Party and the anti-Marcos democracy movement uh, inspired the Filipinos in this country to get more actively involved in their universities and the Eritreans and the Ethiopians were constantly battling each other. They all left to become leaders of their countries later on uh, or, or participants in their struggles later on, uh, and but they all affected the discourse uh, of the student bodies at the places where uh, they went. In the 80s, as the battle over tuition uh, uh, became fees at the City University of New York uh, uh, developed, and there were massive strikes in the late 80s uh, at the City University, it was largely led by Dominican and Haitian students, not by the Puerto Rican or the African American students, but by the new generation of students that felt excluded or, or marginalized. Uh, and, um, uh, and they began uh, leading the battle. And I think today, in many of the universities, it's the Muslim uh, and the African students who are increasingly f feeling the brunt of what is going on in their home countries and feel the need, even here within the United States, to be able to speak out. And, uh, uh, and of course, the dreamers among the uh, Guatemalan and the Honduran and the, and the, the most recent immigrant, Mexican immigrant families. So the, the locus of where the movement is coming from, but I think one of the th is one of the things that's to me has always been pretty clear is that the urban university in the United States is almost always situated in a minority community because that's where the land is the cheapest and where they can expand at the fastest clip without having to worry about opposition from their local area, and so the university then becomes uh, much more affected by its community. And there's much more relationship between the students, as, as you were saying, and the community. The community impacts the university, makes demands on the university. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the university is forced to contend with the actual space in which it, 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 uh, it rests. Now, NYU is a little different because the community here is a little different, but when you, but if you go, if you go to the, when you deal with the University of Pennsylvania or you deal with, uh, with, uh, Southern Cal or you deal with, uh, with Columbia, these universities are all right smack in the middle of, of, uh, minority communities that, uh, make, uh, force the university to contend with their children <laughs> that go to the schools as well as to what they do, what their social role in, uh, uh, in that city and in society is. Uh, and, uh, so I think that that, uh, uh, that does have an impact on how they, how their their policies and their and their their teaching develops. My my question is about NYU's role in South Africa. Um, I believe we have a branch campus there. Is that right, or some kind of presence? So in any case, uh, let's think about foreign universities, uh, foreign to South Africa. Are there any examples of, um, of improvements in, in student performance or maybe social equity because of the involvement of these outside um, educational institutions? And maybe is there a role for massively open online courses to, um, to help? Um, so I'd like to know about the damage the neutrality or the positive effects of um, foreign educational institutions in South Africa? And you could extend the answer to the so-called global south if you wanted to, or all of Africa. Um, so that I'm curious about that. So I mean, I'll, I'll speak a bit about South Africa. The, the, um I know that there are, there's a entire movement of, through internationalization of, of uh, U.S. universities and so on, setting up campuses in many parts of the world. Our university system, as far as I know, and Salim might be able to correct me on this, is is fairly uh, regulated in terms of the of, of foreign campuses uh, degree like being based in in South Africa, issuing degrees. There's an Australian university system called Monash that has been there for a long time, and so on. But where we do have very strong, of course, international links is, is the range of partnerships that universities have. And, and those can be, you know, can take many different forms. Some are very, we might say, helpful and, and empowering and, uh, and attempt to be equitable. 
uh, in the best kinds of ways. And some are, of course, extensions of all kinds of motivations that are not always in the interest of the institutions or the places where people are seeking to, to have partnerships. So that depends very much on the kinds of negotiations that happen between the universities themselves. Uh, you know, as some of my colleagues might say, you know, we, we, the danger is of one becoming the field workers for other people's research in, in a very crude way, or that you don't necessarily want to be a place that only hosts some people and have no movement the other way around, right? That you want those resources to be shifted. So we're seeking those kinds of partnerships. Uh, when we talk about creating, somebody asked about creating South South Links. Of course, it's we all uh, in some ways want to do that. In practice, it's very hard to do that because we come up against many resource and other constraints. And oftentimes, some of the the the, the linkages that U.S. universities have forged between universities in the South have been very useful in a sense that they've been able to bring people together, but not completely determine those those relationships. So I think you know there's 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 that. Um, it's not as I would say a situation as that, as uh, as some other places where where private universities and private higher education has completely transformed the landscape uh, in in all kinds of ways, you know, that are good or bad. I I just want to say something also about uh, this, you know, the the university and you asking about the street, and uh, and just one of the things that's interesting about this current moment is is. Um, and again, you know, it's not cl clear where this will go, but it's it's that the student campaigns have linked to uh, to the to the to the question of workers on the universities in very self conscious ways uh, to say that what has happened. So we have a state system, but over the last ten or fifteen years, what you will see is that the state universities have each had to take care, more or less, they have a, a support from the government, a certain amount of money, and some of it comes from fees, and some of it comes from money that they raise. And they have tried to cut costs, and one way to do that is to outsource the support staff in universities, the cleaning staff, the ground staff, the security staff, and so on. And the students in some of the campaigns have linked the demands that they have around fees and so on to the end of outsourcing uh, of workers at universities and have compelled managements uh, at some universities to reverse the process of outsourcing, which is a very difficult thing to do because you have to then uh, uh, basically double wages, pay benefits, you know, all the money that was being saved has to be moved back into that. So it's a, it's a complicated question. But they have linked it to, 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 on the basis of saying that these workers are also our parents, that their issues that they're confronting are also our issues, and so on. So in a very self-conscious effort to do that. I will say that one of the challenges, in because we have the state system, is that the, the, the ways in which we have commercialized some aspects of our universities has been uneven. So the ones that elite universities have tended to have better relations with universities, say, in the US, who, who would then have better funding arrangements with them and so on. And so able to mobilize their cultural capital to, to build themselves. Others who are from more working class universities, uh, black South African universities, struggle to, to make those kinds of, of, of links. And so what you have is a, it was a state university system, highly differentiated. And I would say the people who've been put in the most difficult spot in all of this in some ways are the vice chancellors because they have to manage this institution which is given a relative degree of autonomy. So you have to work with your budget and you have to account to your students, your constituencies, and the state says, well, we will support you, but you deal with it in a certain way. And it's put, it, one of the, I think, things that's being raised in this moment is to say, we have more or less left all of these things to individual universities to manage. The issues have been confronted, fees have been, students have uh, protest against fees at, you know, uh, uh, somebody said at other universities, it's all been dealt with there, the police have been called in, the management has dealt with it, but the linkages have not been made to say, actually, your predicament is our predicament. And, uh, and, and, and so what's happened now is, in a sense, either it's going to return to the, each university to sort itself out, and the vice chancellors are under tremendous strain, uh, 
uh, and we'll go back to a certain kind of normalization until the next year when registration and the fees issues is going to emerge. Or it's a moment to say, actually, uh, let's defend this as a public university system. Let's become conscious of the ways in which we're creeping into privatizing uh, the system uh, and connect it to all of these other kinds of uh, struggles, I would say. Sorry, there's something in the back. Excuse me for coming a little late. I, I, I just came in when Juan Gonzalez was speaking, and I was privileged to hear what you said about uh, the decolonization. <clears throat> However, uh, I think I'm closer to your age than their age, so I remember a lot of things, and I have some questions. Do you believe that the Red Brigade and the Minor Beithoff and the 68 Revolution in France and all that stuff with those kids affected our kids, they were passionate. They were burning. They understood the issues. They were political. They were social. It, it, they weren't talking about their colonization. They were looking at it at a, at a, as, as an illness, as a toxic, endemic, global situation, which, in effect, did reach the Columbia students who took over. I was here. NYU was last. After everybody did everything, some crazy kids took over the Quran Institute and locked themselves and chained themselves and threatened they were going to blow it up. Of course, it was so late in the game that everything was OK. They, they, they had a dialogue. My, my information that I would like to put on the table is that I did not become aware of this till maybe a year or two ago. but. There have only been 10,000 or maybe 11 or 12,000 books translated from the English language into Arabic. So all we want from these people who we say, where are the moderate Muslims? Well, the literature and everything that we're talking about is such an assault and so much to learn and is so frightening that to respond to the zealots and the fanatics is a very big step. And being here in this country and all of a sudden seeing that they may be marginalized or they're hated because people, we don't understand them, this is a big quagmire. I listen to you, Juan, when you're on with Amy Goodman all the time. I read you. I, I understand where you're coming from. But we're standing on the shoulders of some very brave people. In Puerto Rico, Antonio, Antonio Panto, Pantoja and Aspira and other things, they were very hardworking people who set up networks to try to spread the word. I think today, if Stephen Biko was here, he would not have been able to suffer the way he did, and the message would have been much larger, and it wouldn't have been that hard to get a play on Broadway about Stephen Biko. I am delighted that you mentioned the play about Hamilton. This kid is a genius. What he was able to do is outrageous. Everybody, I, I, I implore you to see this, because you will be able to see how a not great student, not a wealthy kid, somebody who had two supportive parents bet on the fact that he was going to be somebody, no matter where it came out. And he took the um, formal sonnet form and other forms and put it into the most avant-garde approach in the most popular venue to tell the story of our founding father saying, hey, you know what? Hamilton wasn't such a big shot. He wasn't even legitimate. A question I want to ask is this. Juan, where is the passion? Will everybody understand that when Bernie Sanders says, you know, we shouldn't be putting the money into more the system of incarceration, but having a free university, and people think, oh, that's crazy. Well, one of the great sentences that he had, he, he's been a little bit uh, on and off, but when he's great, he's great. One of the sentences that he said that was still in my head, he said, you know, not too long ago, they thought it was a wild idea to have a free public high school education. That wasn't something that was so easy, but it isn't that far-fetched that we should be able to have, in this country, a free college education. You know what it costs to go to this school. And we're not getting all the money. Well, about the issue of the passion, I, 
I have a different a, approach since I, I remember the periods when there where there was supposedly a lot of passion. I believe that there's been a big major change in this country in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, I think that the combination, again, you've got to have, uh, uh, passion doesn't arise in a vacuum. <laughs> you know, discontent doesn't arise in a vacuum. Uh, the reason why there was so much passion and so much uh, rebelliousness among the youth in the late 60s was that the country was facing a virtual civil war internally and a huge uh, uh, war externally in Vietnam that was claiming thousands and thousands of lives a, a week and a month, not over the entire duration of the war. So that uh, the the young people of those days had no choice but to confront the reality of what they were facing at the time. You know, as I tell a lot of young people who, who, who uh, are amazed by what happened in Ferguson, um, uh, in the week after Martin Luther King was killed, uh, was assassinated in April of 1968. There were riots and rebellions in over 100 cities in the United States. Not one, not two, 100 cities in the United States. And in the period of one week, experienced major racial disturbances. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the army was called out to surround the Capitol. Uh, to protect the capital from uh, the, uh, the, the the racial uh, uh, uprising in Washington, D.C. itself. Uh, and uh, so it was a very different time. I do, though, think that the young people especially, uh, and this goes back to this whole question of fees, I believe that the, the main driving force behind the Occupy movement was the fact that there were tens of thousands of young people who suddenly got were getting out of college in the midst of the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression to realize that they had no job prospects and huge debt. <laughs> and they had nothing to lose at that point but to, uh, to take some kind of action. But that, that really Occupy was uh, preceded, and I remember when we started out in Democracy Now! in, in 19, it's gonna be 20 years now, was, we started in February of 96. And in 1999, uh, when we were just a radio show, we decided that we were going to cover the gathering protests against the World Trade Organization meetings in Seattle. Uh, the, uh, and um, that we were going to take the whole show to Seattle and cover it, you know, two hours a day. And we were the only show that did it. Uh, and, um, uh, and I believe that the modern left movement in the United States originated in Seattle uh, in 1999. Uh, because when I saw the immense creativity and determination of these young people that descended on Seattle uh, over an issue that the rest of the country knew nothing about, absolutely nothing uh, about, World Trade Organization agreements. Most Americans had never heard of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and the determination that those young people had and the effectiveness that they had in being able to totally pa paralyze a, a, a meeting of ministers, of economic ministers from around the world, I said, wow, there's a whole new, there's a whole new movement that's come around in this country. And then, uh, you know, I was troubled that it was a largely white movement, that it wasn't, it wasn't very diverse, but that has changed over time. And not only that, the ability of the protesters to paralyze the entire World Trade Organization inspired environmentalists and activists all around the world to see the possibilities that they got together. So what you've had over the last 10 years is this enormous youth international movement has developed around globalization, the environment, uh, and, uh, and of course it became, it became much more focused on um, economic justice uh, after the Great Recession, uh, that there is a vast movement. It just doesn't get covered. It doesn't get paid attention to, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or the Dreamers, or there's all of these movements that have developed now uh, that all are moving in the same direction, a more equitable society, a more just society. So now, and this is in the absence of body bags coming in large numbers, you know, that they, like there were in Vietnam, uh, uh, in, in the absence of this uh, uh, 
immediate threat of a civil war within the country itself, you know, that, uh, so that I think that really there's really lots of basis for hope in terms of uh, what is happening in terms of the potential for young people to address serious social issues. Uh, and you're seeing, you're seeing uh, major victories. I mean, Obama, you know, uh, President Obama in his last year has done more than he did in the entire seven years before, you know, and uh, in terms of responding to some of the issues, whether it's uh, Cuba or whether it's uh, or, or whether uh, it's Cuba policy, it's a mass incarceration, it's the Keystone Pipeline. All of a sudden, he's responding to all of these issues that that these movements of young people have been crying about now and, and pressing for quite a while. So I think it's it's you know there's reason for hope. It's not. I mean, there's a lot to be done, but there's certainly reason for hope. We're uh, running close on time, so I'm going to take the privilege of asking you one last question since you didn't deliver on the incendiary remarks. <laughs> but I, I wanted to thank both of you for really thoughtful and, and inspiring remarks this evening. I guess the question I wanted to ask the both of you is if you might, what you might say um, about the responsibilities and the moral responsibilities of being at a university today. So when, when I, we hear Juan talking and we think about the context of what it's like to be a student activist at a university like NYU. By and large, you're taught by someone who was in a precarious situation. Uh, you're struggling to make ends meet. Um, you worry about the conditions of the workers who work in one of our various affiliates. You think about university's role in gentrification. I mean, there's so much to be done in addition to the curricular struggles and diversity struggles, which I think are far from one in any university, but here in particular. So I don't know. In, 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 I, I suppose I wanted to ask both of you what you think, what is the responsibility for people in universities or universities like NYU? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now I always sort of tell people that uh, when you're in a South African university, you can never be the kind of academic that I, I witness sometimes here, which is somebody who, goes into their office and does their research and goes home and publishes prodigiously and uh, is that the, the problems outside are intruding and not that I think from what you were saying I mean I don't that's to also caricature a certain kind maybe I've seen Columbia University stuff <laughs> uh, academics but it's it's to uh, you know is that in our cases the, the the external is always inside your office and always intruding and always you your students their predicaments their uh, are always there, so it is a a constant thing to quest to question oneself, to question what one's role is uh, in a university, to be, you know, both accountable, responsible to to what it is you're there as a researcher to do, what what you're writing about. It inflects itself in you in all kinds of ways, and um, and I would say there was uh, just on the, on this point of hope, as much as some of my colleagues are are quite as we are with with where we the positions we occupy in the university you know, we're worried when we see disruption and we see certain things that students do and say that this has been we've we've also i think in the last 10 years been complaining that our students have lost any sense of politics they don't take up any issues they you know facebook cell phone social media etc and the music scene and 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 this has actually been a a, a kind of uh, inspiration for some of us to, to see these things, even though we are uncertain and we're not sure where, where it's going, it's actually given one a sense that there's a generation here that is uh, that is going to take over these institutions, always going to play a certain role in the society. And as much as we might despair about the, the party politics situation and the leadership and all kinds of other things going on in the country, actually these people are asking very critical questions. And uh, our role has really been to try and, you know, to support that in a in a way that that makes sure that uh, that we don't project ourselves onto their issues. That we are learning as much from them as we want them to learn in the classroom. Um, but I think it is to keep ourselves open to being changed also by these things. You know, um, it's it's tough to to to. Uh, it's one has to always keep oneself vigilant of not becoming that that person who is so frightened of change in an institution that you close yourself off. I think uh, when 
no ways to be open to that but um you know one can and only do that individually in terms of your own consciousness i mean we are here saying we should the role of the academic should be but that's that's at least the, the, the something of a tradition in south african universities that i do think is worth holding on to that we are publicly engaged in all kinds of ways um, you know i i think the big the big question has to be um um what's the what's the social role of a university in modern in modern society uh in in, in this country we have an additional problem we not only have the public universities and the private so-called nonprofit universities, but we have this incredibly fast-growing for-profit, private, uh, uh, almost criminal operation that is going on in terms of whether it's University of Phoenix or our Gold Sea Unit or all of these universities that don't really exist, you know, except online or uh, or, or at the uh, at the trough of the federal uh, loan program. Uh, that they are uh, they're the ones that are. I mean, that's this for profit stuff with universities has to be stopped. But you, in order to stop it, you've got to you've got to have a debate over what's the role of a university in in the society because these people are. I'm telling you, there are hundreds of thousands, especially of African-American and, and Latino young people that are being suckered in every day to take out these loans for sc online schools that will produce nothing for them except debt for the rest of their lives. Uh, and something has to be done about this. It has to, and, and there has to be a major battle with the government to stop funding, providing loans for these universities that don't produce any results. The, now the nonprofit universities have their own problem. They have their edifice complexes and their huge payrolls and and all of this other stuff and their total selling of their naming rights for every building and and, and every program and every auditorium uh, for whoever wants to give them money uh, and or their science programs or their research programs. That has to that battle has to continue. But that all involves or what's the social role of the university? Is it to become basically a whore to whoever has money to give them, uh, you know, or is it to actually create a climate where young people can learn and research and better understand the world and play a more important role in society. So you know, I got to have that battle out. And the, the private universities, for the most part, the private nonprofits are still getting away with, you know, their huge endowments and all their other stuff. But I think that the, at the public university level and at this for-profit level, there has to be a battle waged over what, are, what role are they playing in, in, in providing education to the America's young people. And, uh, and um, uh, you know, and uh, what the, I, the most important thing is, student, you got to you got to use the opportunity to learn as much as you can, because <laughs> you're never going to have as much freedom and t free time and a uh, chance to in, uh, to follow your inquiry and your pursuits and your uh, interests as you will during this time. Because once you get out that, out there, it's a it's a hard world out there, <laughs> and uh, they're not going to give you time for anything. You know, uh, so uh, uh, but I think that. Um, uh, that the and the professors have to you know I understand it's tough and it's uh, and um, um, but I think that the, uh, the the faculty have to put a little get a little bit more backbone and courage and uh, and uh, and you know stand with the students a little more and stand against the administration a little more and uh, uh, whenever they can. You well, got your incendiary. I did. I did. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.